Welcome back to Have You Swallowed the Hook, a 21st century challenge to a 19th century worldview of evolution. My name is Thomas Bentley, and we're now at episode number four, where they tell you, you have no choice. And as we begin tonight, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we talk about this idea, the evolutionist worldview that you have no choice, help us to see, Lord, that in fact, you have given us great amount of choice, choice to choose you or not. Help us to see you as our creator. Help us to understand the immensity of the choices we make every day. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And to begin this presentation, we need to, as we build up to this idea that you have no choice, we need to start with science itself. And where I'm going to start was with fashion. You know, all of us understand fashion. As we look at the pictures here, we see that some of these fashions up there are hundreds of years old, and, and of course, they're not fashionable today. Well, in science, ideas become fashionable. And fashionable ideas in science are called paradigms. And basically what a paradigm is, is a paradigm is a belief about how something should be or something should act. It's something that all scientists have. Let me give you an example of how paradigms can become fashionable and then they can change the fashion. The example I'd like to give you is told originally by Dr. Ariel Roth. And what it is, is it's talking about a man named Alfred Winger. And Alfred Winger was a geologist. And while he was living, the paradigm, if you will, the fashionable idea in science was that the continents that we have on our world are fixed. They didn't move, never move, they just say they're fixed. But Alfred Winger was a little different. He looked at the, how the continent of South America kind of looks like a key to Africa, and he says, you know, I think continents actually shift. But all of his life that he was living, his idea was very unfashionable in the fashion conscious world of science. And so he was excluded from, you know, basically playing science games until his death. And amazingly, after his death, suddenly science shifted fashion. And now the fashionable paradigm was that continent shifted. Dr. Ariel Roth writes about this. He says, before acceptance, you were not part of the geological community if you believed that continents shifted. Afterwards, to believe that they did not slide across the surface of the earth made you a geological outcast. And so what we can see is that science is really about fashionable ideas. And one of the leading scientists that really kind of brought this to the fore was a man named Dr. Thomas S. Kuhn. And he writes in a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions the following. He says, the social behavior of scientists has more influence on science than the actual quest for truth. In other words, these fashionable ideas can actually control what scientists do in, in the face of real truth. He writes this. He says, because scientists accept paradigms as true, they regard any explanations that do not fit the accepted view as false and interpret the data supporting such unacceptable explanations as anomalous. In addition, they reject those who propose ideas outside the paradigm. And of course, we recognize that evolution is simply a paradigm, and that's what's happening in science today. In fact, with all the discoveries we have and all the scientists coming forward and saying, hey, there's design here, there's design here, we have a whole structure of people wearing fashionable ideas that are like the three monkeys. They see no intelligent design, they hear no intelligent design, they speak no intelligent design, and it's all because of the fashions in science, these fashionable ideas. But here's where I want to share with you something that's very important. And that is this. Fashionable ideas in science are not value neutral. They have ripple effects on the society at large. And what I'd like to do is I would like to look at the six ripple effects of the fashion of evolution and how they have impacted our society. For example, the first one, in fact, all of them fall in this category, in this bucket, and this is the one called social Darwinism. Let's take a look 
at what social Darwinism is. Essentially, if you want to look at my definition of it, social Darwinism is the lowering of humanity to the level of beasts. It's the application of Darwin's survival of the fittest to society at large. And probably one of the first people to actually coin the phrase survival of the fittest was a man named Herbert Spencer in England, a, a, someone who lived at the same time as Darwin did. And essentially what he did was this. This is written in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. This is how well known this is. That it's in encyclopedias. He says, social Darwinism is a philosophical economic, social, and scientific movement that claims that the way society functions is and ought to be a reflection of the methods and movements of biological evolution, with winners moving upward to success and losers eliminated. Losing organisms fail to reproduce, losing firms go bust, losing people starve. And so this is the essence of the evolutionist worldview of social Darwinism. Uh, some should be rising up, others should die. And this is exactly what we find. Uh, one of the evolutionists in America, his name was William Graham Sumner. He was written about in Richard Hofstadter's Social Darwinism in American Thought. And he's written as saying that millionaires are a product of natural selection. And this is going to be a theme that we're going to see throughout this, is that for, for Darwinists, those who are wealthier in our society are higher evolved, and the rest, in other words, the 1% the in society is the highest evolved, and the 99% are simply the chattel. And what's, what should happen to them? We should oppress them and basically get rid of them. That's the whole idea behind social Darwinism. Listen to this uh, 19, 1879 lecture on hard times. This is in Richard Hofstadter's historical book. He says, if we do not like the survival of the fittest, we have only one possible alternative, and that is the survival of the unfittest. A plan for nourishing the unfit and yet advancing civilization no man will ever find. This is a quote from Sumner. And this is how it was felt in the 19th century as we go into the 20th century. This was the kind of attitudes that we had. For example, he said this, If poverty is ever to be abolished, it will be by a more energetic prosecution of the struggle. And of course, what does that mean? The culling away of those who are lesser evolved. That's kind of how it all worked. And there were even religious people getting involved in evolution. This guy here, his name is Henry Ward Beecher. He was an evolutionist, but he was also a, a, a pastor, a preacher. He got involved in a, a labor dispute where the, the workers were saying, hey, we don't have enough money to survive. We can't even feed our families. And here's what he's quoted as saying. Is not a dollar a day enough to buy bread with? Water costs nothing, and a man who cannot live on bread <laughs> is not fit to live. You see the attitude? The 1% the one, the one should get everything, the 99% should have nothing. I mean, live on bread and water. This is kind of how they thought. This was the era of the robber baron in America. It's the era of child labor, and it was a very hard time for people living in those days. And social Darwinism made it all the more harder. In fact, one of these men that lived in this time was another pastor. His name was Russell Conwell. He, he's uh, famous for his sermon, Acres of Diamonds. This guy got rich during this time preaching a message we call a prosperity gospel. Here's how this evolutionist believed. He said, it is our God-given duty to get rich. <laughs> Check that out. He, he goes on to write, poverty results from an individual's sins. Thus to sympathize with the man whom God has punished for his sins, thus to help him when God would still continue a just punishment, is to do wrong. And so essentially what this evolutionist had done was he equated uh, being less evolved as being sinful. Being higher evolved as being less sinful. In other words, you, know, you, you raise up in morality based upon how much wealth you have. And this is how it was in those days. By the way, we still have the same kind of prosperity gospel today, where you see in Time magazine saying, does God want you to be rich? Some mega churches say yes. And of course, this is, has its roots all the way back in social Darwinism. But here's where I want to transition to the next of these six ripple effects, and that is part of social Darwinism is the idea of imperialism. And let's explain what that is. Uh, Vance Farrell pretty much describes it best in his book, Evolution Cruncher. He says, Darwin 
unleashed a moral holocaust upon the world. He taught the most vicious set of moral principles and said, the most successful animals are those that are the first to attack and destroy. And this is really what imperialism is. It's seeing another as being weaker and believing that you have the moral right then to take over what they have and to kill. And this is exactly what happened, what we saw in Europe at World War I. It was a time when the most vicious uh, weapons were being created, like mustard gas and the machine gun. And in World War I, there were so many casualties and they were all the result of social Darwinism and imperialism. In fact, if you read in the Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, it says that the Schaffen Plan, which was the plan that the Germans had put together to actually conquer the weaker nations, was a plan that was put together specifically based upon Darwinian ideas. They write, Darwin argued that organisms with traits well suited for their environment would be the most likely to survive and reproduce. The social Darwinist ideal twisted this commentary to argue that the most powerful had the ability, even the right, to dominate weaker ones and to mold human relations as they saw fit. And of course, what was the result of that? The last century was filled with social Darwinism. World War I and its atrocities and its loss of life. World War II and its atrocities and loss of life. The rise of atheistic communism and the horrors that occurred throughout the world really basically based upon atheistic communism. All of them having their roots in social Darwinism. This is interesting. Clara Lucas Balfour in Asimov's book of science and nature quotation says this, and this is the essence of social Darwinism. Mankind struggles upwards in which millions are trampled to death that thousands may mount on their bodies. And that is the worldview of evolution, the social impact of evolution. And another one of these is eugenics. Eugenics is very interesting. Sir Francis Galton was the man who originally claimed this was a cousin of Darwin. And the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences writes that Galton used statistical studies of British families to show that reputable families, read rich, wealthy, were much more likely to, than ordinary families to produce superior offspring. And of course, this is the bottom line. And in, in Britain at that time, they were actually taking measurements of people checking their genealogy and their heritage and their wealth status to determine who really is the, the more preferred, the more evolved than anyone else. And the idea behind eugenics is really to encourage reproduction in families perceived to have talent, in other words, wealth, and discourage reproductions of the masses of individuals perceived to be of inferior quality. And this is the essence of eugenics. Eugenics, if you look at this picture of this, basically the, the outline of eugenics, this tree here, you'll see it touches every area of your life, including politics, the economy, and every single aspect of your life. They want to look at it from the perspective of evolution. And of course we did in the United States of America. In 1924, they passed this idea of the National Origins Act to exclude people from other countries that were feel to be less evolved. Then there was the, they authorized the Virginia Sterilization Act, where they were actually sterilizing people that were considered to be lesser evolved. This was, went to the Supreme Court, it was upheld in the United States in a Supreme Court decision in 1927 called Buck versus Bell. And they forced sterilized over 65,000 people during this time. And another part of this was uh, evolution was that some of us were more evolved than others. Take, for example, Margaret Sanger. She's the lady who was the founder of Planned Parenthood. And of course, her letters are being stored at Smith College in, in Massachusetts. And one of those letters, she writes this, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population because for them, evolutionists, they were lesser evolved than, than other people are. In fact, if you look at the, that decade, there were horrible things that happened to African Americans in America. They actually would let them get syphilis and then leave it untreated just to see what would happen. That actually happened, and of course that was part of eugenics, believing that some people are lesser evolved than other people. Now, imagine what happens when you combine social Darwinism and eugenics. You combine them all together. What do you get? 
You get the horrors of World War II. You get mass exterminations of whole populations of people. Listen to what it says in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. They said, in Germany, Alfred Politz and other scientists applied American eugenics to the new science of race hygiene and the eventual Nazi extermination of millions of Jews, gypsies, and persons with disabilities and other unfit individuals during World War II. This is the result of Darwinism in our life. And today we see it all the time through something called abortion. Abortion is where you kill the unborn child, and that's part of eugenics. Listen to what this uh, book says. There's a book that was written by a guy named Stephen Levitt. He's a eugenicist. He's an evolutionist. It was called Freakonomics. Listen to how he describes the benefits of abortion. He says, abortion has been the most dominant factor in declining crime rates. Unwanted children are more likely to become criminals. And since the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, fewer unwanted children have been born, resulting in a reduction in crime rates. Do you see that? Let's kill children. We'll reduce crime. But this is all part of social Darwinism. It's part of the evolution in our world. Even the current science advisor for the President of the United States today is an evolutionist. He is also a eugenicist. He promotes forced sterilization. If you read his book, Echo Science, Population, Resources, and Environment, you will find that this is the case. Now, let's talk about another of these ripple effects, and that is racism. Racism. Now I want you to look at something for a minute. Let's take a look at Darwin's book, and let's look at the rest of it. Most people just read the origin of the species, but they live out the part that's the most important. By means of natural selection, which we just learned could never do it, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. In the very title of his book, he shows the racism that he has for people. Let me give you an example. In his book, The Descent of Man, he says this. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. You catching this? At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian and some ape as low as the baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Did you catch that? This man is an absolute racist. He believes that some people are lesser evolved than others, and he was hoping that in the future, the white races would eventually exterminate all those who were not. And in fact, in his day, it was very common for them to see the world this way, where the Europeans were always seen as having the most higher evolved form, and then they would show pictures of African Americans and make, make up their, their skulls to, to show that they're closer to the apes than we are. This, my friends, is what we call racism, believing that somebody is lesser evolved than you are. That's racism. And it's still with us. The theory of evolution keeps racism alive. This happens to be from a Discover magazine that I happened to find. And when I saw this picture, it just about blew my mind that even today we have the same stereotyping where they were showing an article about evolution and the evolution of man. And here they show uh, apes going to people that look sort of like African Americans to people who have lighter skin. This is the idea. It's still with us even today. Uh, for example, uh, they found an actual human skull in, in China, and they called it the Red Deer Cave People, but they wanted people to understand that they were pre, you know, people like ourselves, and so here's the picture that they drew to help us understand that this was not like us higher evolved people. You get the idea? See, racism has always been a part of evolution. I mean, how many of you have ever seen one of these monkeys to man's pictures? Let me ask you a question. Who do you always see at the end of the line? It's always a Caucasian male. 
Hello, this is what we call racism. Evolution is racism. It is the most insidious form of racism on the planet, and yet it is part of our world today, and our government endorses it. You know, it was Hitler himself that said, take away the Nordic Germans and nothing remains but the dance of apes. This is how evolutionists see society. This is social Darwinism right there. And it's never ending. I, uh, this is a USA Today article that I saw. And I see these in USA Today and other uh, popular media all the time where they want us to believe that somehow we are related to the apes. You know, I'm, I'm going to share with you right now, your DNA is completely different than that of an ape. There may be some similarities in different areas, but guess what? You're unique. And, but they put this in front of you to make you believe the story that some of us are more evolved than others. And that, of course, is racism. Now let me stop for a moment and share with you the creation worldview, just so we can have a breather here in this program. You know, in the creation worldview, all of the prototype humans were first created by God. They were all created in the image of God, and that means life is precious because we are the children of God. All people are equal in the creation model. In fact, it says in James chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, if you really fulfill the royal law, that would be the Ten Commandments, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But is you show partiality, you're committing sin. In other words, if you show partiality, you're actually committing sin. Well, let's look at another one of these ripple effects. These are the last two of the six that I'm going to share with you today. And this is the ones that are probably the most insidious to our young people and the lives of people today. It's sociobiology and evolutionary psychology. Sociobiology and evolutionary psychology. Now, what in the world is that? Well, here's what it is. The goal behind the evolutionists today is to try to deconstruct every human behavior so that it can be attributed to evolution. Of course, we understand this now from our last lecture that this is called naturalistic philosophy and they have to produce material explanations, materialistic explanations for everything in the world. This is called deconstruction. So we deconstruct every human behavior so that it can be attributed to evolution. That's really what it is. And the way they do it is they attach a behavior to your genes. You know, they, since they believe that we're all related to the animals through evolution, they'll look out into the world and they say, hey, look at that uh, animal over there and how they're behaving. I wonder if we have a gene like theirs. Oh, well, we do. Well, hey, guess what? Now that behavior is our behavior. Well, let's attach that behavior to your genes. And of course, that means that you have to do it. Let me give you an example. Let's take the idea of generosity. There certainly isn't anything in the evolutionist model that tells us that being generous or helping someone, giving something of yourself. Remember, evolution is survival of the fittest. So where in the world do we get this idea of being kind and generous and giving? Well, evolutionists have a problem with that. So they have to have a materialistic explanation. So here's what it is. Ah, let's go back to our friend Richard Dawkins, the atheist. He writes in his book, The Selfish Gene. If an organism appears to behave altruistically, we can be assured that its motives is fundamentally selfish. <laughs> can you believe somebody could write that? Organisms are largely under the control of their genes, and the principle of survival of the fittest promotes their own selfish survival to the detriment of other different genes. And so what he's doing here is he's saying that you're really selfish, and being generous is really selfishness, and guess what? You all get it. You're forced to do it because of a behavior being attached to your genes. And this is the whole game with evolutionary psychology and sociobiology is to attach a behavior to your genes. I mean, look how Time Magazine uh, it shows this all the time. He says, infidelity, it may be in your genes. You're forced to do it. You're not making a choice to, be, uh, to cheat on your wife or your husband. You're forced to do it by your genes. You're controlled. Guess what? You don't have any choice. Let me share with you a story that happened in uh, January 28th of 2011. It's one that really shocked me, but it really tells me where this is going. It was reported in the New York Times, and the, the focus of the story was a judge. His judge's name was Gary L. Sharp. And here's what happened. There was a man who was brought before him who was, had been arrested for child pornography. And of course, we obviously that's a bad crime, but when he went to psychologists and psychiatrists, they said, listen, judge, we don't believe that he's going to do this again. We believe he's learned his lesson, he's paid his dues, 
And so uh, what happened was this man comes into court, he stands before him, and this is what the judge says. Opinions of the psychologist and the psychiatrist as to what harm you may pose to those children in the future is virtually worthless here. Why is that? Let's find out. It is a gene you were born with, and it is not a gene you can get rid of. This judge had been influenced by evolutionary psychology and sociobiology, and so what he said was, hey, this guy didn't make a choice to do that, that he could choose not to do it. He was forced to do it because of a gene that he had for child pornography. In other words, he was forced into his behavior. He had no choice. And so he says this. He says, you are what you're born with, and that's the only explanation for what I see here. And so he gives this man a much harsher sentence because he believed that he was forced to do it by his genes. That's a, that is basically the essence of evolutionary psychology and sociobiology. Even magazines like The Natural Review have been writing about this. This one here is called Escaping the Tyranny of Your Genes. Where is that coming from? <laughs> the fallacy of genetic determinism. You know, it's, it's everywhere today, this impact of sociobiology. But even evolutionists know that it's not the real world. Let me give you an example. Dr. Michael Ruse writes this in Evolution Wars, A Guide to the Debates. He says, speaking of evolutionary psychology and sociobiology, they did jump way ahead of their evidence and then congratulate themselves on a hard empirical slog, well done. And they were determined not to let a little counter evidence stand in their way. To be candid, they were determined not to let a massive amount of counter evidence stand in their way. Another scientist, Philip Kircher, writes this in his book, Vaulting Ambition, Sociobiology and the Quest for New Human Nature. He says, the ambitious claims that have attracted so much public attention rest on shoddy analysis and flimsy argument. The sociobiologists appear to descend into wild speculation precisely when they should be the most cautious. And this is the case in our world today. So here it is, friends. This is the hook that every single one of you, every single person in, in the world today is being told. This hook that says you have no choice. That your choices are completely controlled by your genes. That you are a walking mechanism. I can only do what I do because my genes tell me. I mean, this is the idea, right? You're a mechanism to these evolutionists. And you don't have a choice in the matter. You're forced to do what you do. And this is a, actually a horrible belief because the reality is this. Your life is based on three things. Your beliefs, your character, and your choices. This is the reality of this world. And let me share with you something. Science is actually starting to come around to this very fact. And uh, this is a magazine that I, I received, and it was really interesting to me from time. They did an article called Why Your DNA Isn't Your Destiny. New science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. In other words, your choices are actually more important than you ever could have realized. And here's the way they describe it. The, the DNA that's in every single cell of your body is basically like firmware that's in a computer. The firmware is put in there and it never changes, ever. You boot it up, boot it down, you can't change the firmware. And that's kind of how DNA is. It's the instructions that make you. Well, the epigenome they discovered was a set of chemicals that lay on top. Epidermis is the first layer of your skin, right? Epi means upon. And so the epigenome sits upon the DNA. And this is where it gets interesting because the way they described it was that the epigenome in our bodies is like a conductor. Now, it doesn't turn the violins into, say, the brass, like in evolution. Instead, what it does is it takes all the instruments there, like a conductor, and the conductor adjusts the tempo as the music is playing. It raises up the brass here. It lowers down the sound here. And that's kind of what a conductor does. And this is what epigenomes do. Except they do it not to music, but they do it to the choices that you make and the circumstances that you are in. Let me give you an example of this. They write, it is these epigenetic marks that tell your genes to switch on or off, to speak loudly or whisper. It is through epigenetic marks that environmental factors like diet, stress, and prenatal nutrition can make an imprint on your genes that is passed from one generation to the next generation. 
Now let's take a look at how this works. They talked about a study. It was a study of 14,024 smokers. And in this population of studies, uh, 166 of the males smoked before puberty. And what they discovered was their children had higher body mass and other problems that the others did not have. It was related to these epigenetic marks. Here's what they write. You can change your epigenetics even when you make a dumb decision at 10 years old. If you start smoking then, you may have made not only a medical mistake, but a catastrophic genetic mistake because it's going to be passed on now to your progeny. But what's interesting about epigenetics is this. How many of you have ever written something on your hand with an ink pen? You know that it'll stay there for a while, but eventually it'll fade away and you'll go right back to having your hand. It's the same thing with epigenetics. Epigenetics is not permanent. Here's an example in the, that they gave in this article. They talked about how scientists had done something to fruit flies that made them grow extra eyes. They stressed them in a way that they grew extra eyes. And interestingly enough, they watched the generations and they would watch to see how this trait was carried on until finally it faded away and they went right back to factory settings. So the D, remember, the DNA is the firmware. The epigenetics actually caused this to happen. And they did the same thing with roundworms. This was an Israeli study where they, they exposed them to a chemical that made them get real fat and dumpy. And they watched as generation after generation had this trait, but eventually it faded away and they went right back to factory specifications. And the science of epigenetics is actually amazing. Here's some facts. You see, epigenetics is not Darwinian evolution. It has nothing to do with that. Epigenetics is actually counter to what they claim in evolution. And epigenetics explains what evolutionists have observed in the past and didn't understand. They just ex extrapolated it, thinking that we were morphing from one kind of life to the other. I'll give you an example. Uh, after Darwin, there were people who went to the Galapagos Islands and they, they looked at finches that were there and they saw the finches that they saw in these populations seemed to, at different times, have different size beaks and they attributed that to evolution. They just extrapolated it and they said, okay, so they're morphing from something else <laughs> to something else. But interestingly, in the book Icons of Evolution, uh, the author, Jonathan Wells, talks about the fact that a group of evolutionists actually came to the Galapagos Islands, they were called the Grants, and what they saw there was they realized that what was happening was this population of finches actually changed their beak sizes due to an environmental stressor. Listen to what they write. The Grants and their colleagues observed that survivors of the drought tended to have slightly larger bodies and slightly larger beaks. This would have been an epigenetic change. They go on to write, after the 1982 to 83 El Nino, with food once again plentiful, the average beak size in medium ground finches returned to its previous value. Generations later, they went right back to factory settings. And so what he writes in his book is that what has happened is the, because of these droughts, these environmental stressors, there was changes that happened in the epigenome that causes physical size changes in these birds. The evolutionists, though, just took that and extrapolated it without looking at the science. But as you look at the science, we find, wow, they go back to factory settings. And this is what epigenetics tells us. The last words in this Time article were so powerful. They said this about epigenetics. But the potential is staggering. In other words, to understand life, to understand how things adapt and how things change, is staggering with this new science of epigenetics. Then they say this, for decades we have stumbled around massive Darwinian roadblocks. You know, it's, it's interesting, the article talks about the fact that the epigenetics has been known about since the mid-century of the last, the 20th century, but has been suppressed until the last decade because of Darwinists who realize what it would do to their theory of evolution. Right now, they're, they're struggling with, they're pulling their hands out right now to try to figure out how to make epigenetics Darwinian evolution because of what's doing. And so I come back to this point, friends. What science is showing us today is that your life is a product of your choices. And your choices are based upon three things. Your beliefs, your character, and of course, your choices. And choices make a big difference, friends. 
You know, I want to share with you a story that I love from Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. I don't know if you ever know Uncle Arthur. You need to get to know him. He's a cool guy. He told a story one time about a father and a son. They were standing at a, an intersection of waiting to cross the street, and all of a sudden the, the, a car ran a red light and smashed into another car right in front of them. And the little boy was looking at this whole thing. He looks at his dad. He says, wow. He says, just think, all those people heard just because one man didn't obey the traffic light. Well, he ought to be punished. And his father responds and says, you know, everyone who drives past traffic signals eventually gets punished, and we all have them. And what his father was trying to do was point his son into another direction. He wanted to teach him about something that God, the Creator, our Creator, had placed into every one of us at creation. And that's something we call a conscience. And a conscience is essentially something that tells us green light, yeah, this is okay. Yellow light, be cautious. Red light, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. And all of us have a conscience since creation. In fact, when you think about it, our Creator God is the designer. And just as any designer today has the right to set the boundaries on His design, our God has the right to set the boundaries on His design, on how we would treat one another, on how we would treat Him. And, and in this boundary, He gave us some laws. He gave us some ways of how we should treat Him and treat one another. In fact, in 1 John 3, verse 4, it says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And what this is saying is, is that God set in boundaries. The word sin talks about when we violate that conscience that God has put in our hearts. When we run those red lights, smashing into other people's lives, that is what we call sin. For example, if a person is married and they commit adultery, they have damaged a covenant, a marriage covenant. They have also damaged the life of the one they married. When someone goes to court and they tell a lie about you, they have damaged you. They've run the red light. They have smashed into your life. And now you are being falsely accused. We can understand that. And God has placed into us these red lights. We want to keep these red lights. But what happens? What the evolutionist worldview wants to do, friends, is it wants to remove the traffic light from your heart. It wants to remove your conscience. I'll give you an idea from another story from Uncle Arthur's. It was a story of a little girl and her mother. This little girl's mother had a friend, and her friend owned a store. And this little girl would go with her mother many times to the store. And what she would do while mom and the friend were talking is she would run back into the storeroom. And there she would see things that she wanted to take. But she, one day she found something that she really wanted. And suddenly that traffic light in her head was flashing. No, 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 no. And the reason why was that in that room there was a picture. And the picture, of course, was a person looking down. And this little girl was seeing those eyes looking at her, and her conscience was flashing in her head, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal. And so she, she left with her mother that day, and she didn't steal from her friend. But all that week the little girl was wondering about what she wanted. She really wanted it bad, and so she thought to herself, I have an idea of what I will do. So the next time she goes with her mother to her friend's store, she, her mother talks with her friend, and she sneaks into the back, and there she takes out a pair of scissors that she brought with her, and she cut the eyes out of the picture. And there, with the eyes of her conscience gone, she was able to steal from her mother's friend. So this is what happens, friends, with the philosophy of evolution, where they tell you you have no choice. They tell you you're just a purposeless accident. Life is meaningless. And of course, you have to live by the laws of the jungle where you scratch your way to the top of the heap, regardless of who you violate. And of course, the way they do that is by taking that conscience right out of your heart. They do it by telling you, you have no choice. This is the evolutionist worldview. This is one of the ripple effects of evolution. Let me share with you how the, one, even the original evolutionists saw this. This, is, this man here is Agilus Huxley, one of the atheists. And he writes in a book, Ends and Means, on page 270, I had motive for not wanting the world to have a meaning, consequently assumed that it had none, and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with the problem of impure metaphysics. 
He is also concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do, or why his friends should not seize political power and govern in a way that they find more advantageous to themselves. That sounds like our government today. For myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness, which is basically evolutionism, was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. In other words, evolution, the design of evolution was to remove the conscience from your heart so that you would believe you're just a mechanism, doing what you do, banging into what you do, only because evolution forces you to do it. Your behavior isn't because of your choices. It's because you are forced to do it. But friends, your choices matter more than you could ever know. Think about the world that evolution has brought to us. The year 1999, when two young men, Dylan Klebold and his friend, Eric Harris, wearing a t-shirt that says natural selection on it, not in wrath, but in a plan that they had put together for the entire year to go into their high school in Columbine, Colorado, and kill as many children as they could. Evolution clearly had removed the conscience from their minds so that they could go as a, and believe as a mechanism they could kill as many people as they could. But you know, before we point fingers at anyone else, I want to share with you something the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, 23, that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that all of us at one time or another have thrown out our conscience so that we could run these red lights and that we would hurt other people. The Bible also tells us that the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23. The result of that is death. You know, we will be punished for running those red lights in the end. But fortunately, it doesn't end there. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that a blessing? You know, in the Desire of Ages, it is written this way, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as He deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which He had no share, that we might be justified by His righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was His. By His stripes we were healed. You see, friends, God didn't create us for wrath. He created us in love, and He destined us to be saved in Jesus. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want to share with you, friends, as, as we close today, some of you might be saying, you know, I have been brought up in this world believing that I have no choice. But now you realize your choices matter more than you ever realized. And you're asking yourself the same thing that they asked Peter when he was preaching his first sermon. When they said, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said, to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, he said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and all for a far off for as many as the Lord will call to himself and friend I'm praying today that as you're hearing this the Lord is calling your heart right now because as we are sitting here Jesus Christ is there waiting for you to save you from the fact that you have chosen in your life to run those red lights. He took the penalty for you so that you wouldn't have to. Would you accept his salvation today? And friends, I'm talking to people now who have been grown up in an evolutionist worldview. I'm talking to you as one who's standing outside a burning building, realizing what's going to happen to you and asking you for just a moment to realize that you do have a choice. You're not a mechanism. You're not a product of evolution. You're a product of creation. And your creator God loves you and he wants to save you. Will you accept him today? That is my plea. Will you accept your creator God who made you and loves you? Well, I pray, friends, that you have not swallowed the hook of secular humanism and atheism 
when they tell you you have no choice. I pray that you've made a decision for Jesus Christ. And you know, if you have made that decision today, write to us here at Amazing Discoveries and let us know what it was so we can pray for you. And may God bless you. Well, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to learn more about your creation and to discover how the evolutionist model has so corrupted our world. I'm praying, Lord, for all those people who are now coming out of the evolutionist worldview, coming to their Creator God for the first time, and I'm thanking you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, and God bless you. What? <laughs>